Hey, Catalyst community, we just finished an interview with Dr. Noel Brick. He is the co-author of this great new book, The Genius of Athletes. I love this thing. And we talk about so much of what is covered in the book in this conversation. Everything from self-talk to, frankly, self-listening and what that means to you as you move forward. As always, it's the advanced video version of an episode that will hit the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Podcast probably in the next week or so, but we wanted to get this out early to our subscribers here on the YouTube Coaching Channel. So if you're not yet a subscriber, hit that subscribe button, let us know you like what we're doing, and we'll keep this thing going. So thanks for joining us, enjoy the interview, and let's go be a catalyst. Dr. Nolbrick, it is such a privilege. I am so excited about this book. Congratulations. Thank you, Brad, and, and I really appreciate your invitation to come along. Um, uh, and thank you. That's, that's, um, it's nice to hear some nice things about the book, so thank you. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because you and I were trading a couple of emails. We've met on, I think, just one occasion, but that occasion was a good one because it was a run. We're both in Ireland for a, a conference and you had organized a, a run for the group. I always thought they should have like a 5K because it's a group of sports psychologists, for goodness sakes. Why are we not racing? See if our stuff works. <laughs> but at least we got out for a run together. So that was great. Uh, let, let's jump right in. I love your reference right out of the gate. I think it's the first chapter you referenced the dumb jock and how that's it's not really a thing anymore. You can't really be dumb and be an effective results oriented jock. Can you talk us through maybe, maybe it's never been that way, but why is it especially not that way now? Um, well, you're right. Maybe, maybe it's never been that way, or, or maybe there's a stereotype that sometimes athletes just, you know, whether it's a simple sport like running that you just mentioned, just engage autopilot and just simply perform to the best of their abilities without any mental process, without any cognitive activity happening. Um, and we know that's very, very much not the case. I mean, you were an outstanding athlete yourself as well as, well as researching this. You, you understand both from the, 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 the practice side of things, but also from the research side of things that actually there's a lot going on. There's a lot to think about uh, in endurance activities and, and in sport in general. Um, and similar to you, I mean, my research has been on what athletes focus on, what athletes think about, uh, predominantly running, but but uh, broadly in the endurance field. Uh, and what has come out from some of the, the the interviews that I've done with athletes, ranging from you know recreational beginner runners right the way through to Olympic athletes, is some of the strategies they use, some of the things they, they think about, how they manage their emotions in you know, really challenging, you know, high pressure situations, how they build their confidence, what they say to themselves, their, their, their inner chatter, their, their self-talk. Some of these strategies are so sophisticated uh, and some of the things that they do to, to deal with some of the situations that arise are, are um, amazing. I mean, I've been sitting in interviews with Olympic athletes sometimes and I'm just amazed in terms of what they say they think about and, and you know, uh, during those events. So, so, so there's kind of, the, I suppose, the first thing, why the dumb jock uh, stereotype, if it ever existed, certainly do, does not exist. Um, and, and I guess as we go through this this chat, we'll talk a bit more about some of those. But but here's another thing that I think is really interesting as well. You know, and this was kind of the the, the, the kind of main goal, and I suppose the premise of the book that, that we wrote is that a lot of these strategies apply to everyday life as mm. well. Um, and I think some of, some of the feedback that we've got is that, you know, a very simple kind of um, quote that I kind of remember is, you know, you don't really know some of these things exist until you learn them or until you hear them. And, and when you learn some of these strategies, you realize for an athlete how useful they can be to help you overcome some challenges in sport. Uh, and that applies to everyday life, I think, as well, how we can use some of these same thinking strategies to overcome challenges in our everyday life, too. I, I love that. And that's, I think, the, the subtitle of your book just grab me what world-class competitors know that can change your life not your athletic results although it can do that not your only physical pursuits folks we're talking about everything i mean that's what drew me into my phd stuff was how can we take the mental toughness stuff and make it practical functional great the athletes the navy seals they're doing this stuff but is it applicable to what we're doing every day and so yeah i'm, I'm very excited about this so that's that's the next route i want to go here what how how do these things run parallel as far as athletic lessons or things we learn or the athletes have learned at the top level and what we're doing on a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Yeah, I mean, I guess there, there's so much that we can learn from sport. One of the kind of, um, a quote that I keep coming back to that, that was kind of 
originally put out there by one of the fathers of, of well, he was a cognitive psychologist, but really sports psychology in Ireland, Professor Aidan Moore. And he, he used this term to describe sport as a natural laboratory where we could mm. sort of study. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, and what he meant by that was that, you know, there's so much that happens in sport that, that sort of in a, in a microcosm of a game, even, you know, things that happen in a game, the, the pressure we experience, the challenges, you know, some moments we're up, some moments we're down. These scenarios, these situations play out in, in life as well. And what we can learn from sport is, you know, how do, have, how do athletes handle those situations? How, they, how do they stay calm and in the most pressurized, tense, you know, big games with millions of people watching? I and mean, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Yet some athletes thrive in those situations some athletes exceed their usual performance in those situations and you know when you look underneath the hood you realize that to to do that there's a lot of thinking goes on there's a lot of self-talk that goes on there's a lot of strategies that they use in preparation for games what they say to themselves in in the build-up and when I think about how that applies to my life I, I kind of think about situations like you know I'm, I'm, I'm a lecturer at university so you know students preparing for an exam it's, it's something that's really really important if, if you're preparing to give a presentation and work there's sometimes a lot of pressure and so those same strategies you know these are all performance contexts these are all performance situations uh, and the emotions we experience are the same you know matter, no matter whether you're playing a super bowl or, or whether you've got a an exam as a, an undergraduate yeah. student the, the pressure and, and the demands of that situation can be just as as big for both uh, and so the strategies that we use to deal with those situations can, can apply just as well uh, too and, and so that's what we try to do in this book i think we try to Coming from the the strategies that athletes use in sport, um, how can we apply those to, to everyday life? Uh, and what are some situations where they might apply? And for me, it was really fun because w- what I got to do, I guess, was dig into some of the research outside of my field, outside of the field of sport, and learn a little bit about how some of these strategies and some of the evidence for these strategies uh, that apply in some of those contexts we, we mentioned there as well. Um, but but that's one that kept coming back to me, Brad, was that, that natural laboratory that Professor Aidan, Aidan Moore that. spoke about. And I guess that's what we're trying to, uh, to dig into and explore here a little bit as well. Right, right. Love that. Um, you, you talk about Peter Galitzer's if-then planning, and, and it, it's clearly an evidence-based approach. It's not just something some motivational speaker came up with, like, hey, let's call it the if-then. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a thing. It's been studied. It, the evidence is there. Can you walk us through what the strategy is, why it's so effective, and then why you recommend it for any of us to be using? Yeah, so so this was a strategy that uh, Galbitzer developed in in the 1990s, and and I think in the original paper, you know, he, he titled the original paper something like "Big Effects from a Simple Strategy" or "Large Effects from a Simple Strategy" or something like that. And so 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 basically, what he through his research noticed, um, and this has been. I guess, evidence in a lot of of research sense is that, you know, we we all set goals, no matter what area of life, we all set goals, we all form intentions, we all have these things that we want to do. The classic example is probably New Year's resolutions. But the difference is, you know, and and probably the common experience is we don't always follow through, right? We we have these great plans, but we don't really follow through and follow those through into actual behavior. And so Galbitzer's idea was that Okay, well, first of all, understanding what the gap is. So the gap between our intentions and our actual behavior. And how do we bridge that gap? What what, what can we do to ensure that we follow through in those intentions? Uh, and so he came up with this, this strategy, uh, which he originally called an implementation intention, but which is more commonly known as, as if as uh, if then planning. And very simply what it is, is that um, let's say we set a goal. So let's say, for example, I want to run a 5K. Okay, so so maybe that's my, my big goal. Well, on the way to achieving that goal, I'm probably going to encounter a lot of obstacles. Um, there's a lot of things, you know, life sure. yeah, is, yeah, yeah. is going to get in my way. Um, I might come home from work and I'm, I feel tired, you know, and I don't really feel like doing some some running that night. So the Ifton plan, first of all, what we do is, is we we kind of understand, okay, what are the obstacles? So we think about what are the obstacles here. So those are the ifs. What, what are the situations that might get in the way of me uh, following through on my goal? The then is the solution, the the plan. What, what will I do in response to that if situation, the, the obstacle that might get in, in my way? Um, so if I come home late in the evening, I might decide, okay, well, instead of sitting there for you know an hour watching TV to, to try to work up the motivation to, to, to get out and go for a run, I might just say, as soon as I get home, I'm going to put my training gear on and get straight out of the door. And you know, even if I go out for two minutes, 
that's fine. That's okay. But I'll get out the door. That's my then. Uh, I'll start my run. And you know what? I might I might decide to go for a little bit longer once I get out there. Um, so so this is this, this strategy has been applied mostly probably probably in health related behaviors. So whether that's exercise, whether that's you know trying to follow a healthier eating plan, whatever it might be. But the principle is the same, that we identify those obstacles and, and then we have a plan in place to, to overcome those obstacles, uh, if you like. What I actually really like, you know, I suppose I've I kind of spoken about the, then the, the response to a situation in terms of a behavior, so getting out the door to, to exercise. But actually, this applies to our thinking as well. So again, if you know, if I'm in a in a pressure situation, be it whether I'm an athlete or whether it's in in a in work or a student, whatever it might be, you know, and I come up a situ- against a situation where I feel, you know, maybe I potentially feel panicked, or you know, somebody might throw me a question in a podcast that I haven't prepared. <laughs> Never happens <Okay. laughs> <laughs> So, so what's my then? How will I handle that situation? You know, and it might be, okay, well, you know what? What will I say to myself? How will I stay calm? These are these are not behaviors. These are my thoughts. These are my the things I will do to respond in that situation. Uh, and again, that that can be extremely extremely effective. And, and, you know, when I'm kind of working with some athletes, you know, and, and I'm kind of presenting this strategy, because I think it's so incredibly useful. If you think about it this way, if, if you're going into a situation where you might have some doubts or some worries, and those worries could be, you know, what if this happens? What if that happens? Well, if you have a plan in terms of how you're going to respond in that situation, how you're going to deal with it, then it's not so much of a worry anymore, is it? Because, you know, if it happens, well, I know what I'm going to do, or I know how, at least how I'll try to handle that situation. Um, and so it almost balances story. expectations. Uh, it, it, instead of us saying, oh, I'm going to do this 5K, it's going to be easy, it's going to be great, my friends do it, it it's, it's balancing out, you know what, this is probably going to happen, this might happen, this could happen. And so then we're not surprised when it comes about and you got the plan. Exactly. And, and actually, that's a really way, good way of looking at it because you're right. It becomes a little bit more realistic. You, you consider the ifs, you consider the obstacles. Uh, and even, you know, you, we might not get it right all the time. We might come across an obstacle and it might get in our way for it. Absolutely. But that's a huge learning opportunity. And OK, if I come across that again, what would I do differently? How, how would I handle that situation uh, a little bit differently? And again, this is where our if then plans can evolve and can grow and can mature as we go through the process of running a 5k or whatever it might be really like that and and for the coaches that are listening teachers managers parents think of how simple that is you could use this with a a nine-year-old child you could use it with a a new employee yeah it's great now is there any danger of too many obstacles as i go through that i start Oh, well, you know, I'm going to be tired. I'm going to uh, be hungry. I'm going to hurt my foot. I'm going to, you know, whatever. And then you look at it and you go, well, I'm not running off 5K. This thing, this is insane. Is there, cons- do, you, do you say, you know, look for the most obvious five or do you cap that or is that completely individualized? I think w- one thing actually that comes out from this research is that once you have, this is like, you know, answering your question from a slight angle, but one thing that comes out from that research is that, so once we formulate our if-then plan, one danger, if you like, is that we then focus too much on the if. We're looking for the obstacles. We're we're overthinking the obstacle. Um, and that, I think pretty good advice is that, okay, once you've got a plan, fine, the, you know, the plan is there. If it happens, again, it's an if, you know, it's not a when, it's not necessarily going right. to happen. But if it happens, then you've got a, a strategy to, to deal with it. Um, but you're right, you know, sometimes I guess you can kind of overthink those, those situations and overthink those strat- uh, uh, potential ifs then as well. Um, w- one approach I really like, you know, and, and this maybe balances it as well from another angle. We tell uh, angle. We tell a little bit of a story in, in the book about Michael Phelps and, and how he used this for, for his mental preparation for races. And he wouldn't just focus on the, the, the negatives, if you like, you know, the, the what could happen, what, the things he didn't want to happen. He would also focus on the good things that could happen. Um, mm. And again, you know, sometimes good things can happen, but we don't always respond effectively. Sure. Focusing on the good things, you know, if I get into the lead in the race, that's a good thing. But how will I respond in that right. situation? So, so again, we can focus on the good things as well, and 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 that can be really useful to ma- maintaining our momentum um, as as we go through any situation. I think one last thing to mention here, which I think is really important as well. I know you did a really excellent podcast um, a while back with Wendy Wood on on oh, habit formation. Great. It was awesome. It, I really enjoyed that one. Um, and one thing about if then plans is that so. 
what happens cognitively, mentally, when we prepare an if-then plan is that our response to that situation becomes a little bit more automatic. We don't have to think on our feet as much. Mm. Um, and so it's not quite a habit. You know, it's, it's not a habit as, as, as automatic as a habit would be. But our response becomes more automated. Mm-hmm. And so we don't have to, you know, stop and think as much in the situation. We, we've got a plan uh, that comes together or sorry, comes to mind a little bit more readily uh, when we encounter that situation. And you're not using as much mental uh, fuel, if you will, because you, exactly. you save that for something else. Yeah, exactly right. You know, I'm not having to use, well, I'm, I mean, for one thing, I'm not having to maybe use a strategy uh, that's not going to be effective, that it, that might need oh. more self-control. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the mental fuel, the, the willpower that you talk about. So you've mentioned emotion a couple of times. I, I want to walk down this path a little bit because we mm. see such a broad range of responses. What emotion, what, what role do emotions play in achieving our goals or enhancing our lives? And sometimes I get the sense that a lot of research researchers say we need to suppress them or the coaches say we need to suppress them. I, I, I don't know. It, it, can they be the driver? Can they be the, you don't want to live on emotions. You, you can't sustain that for an entire soccer game or basketball game or something, but do emotions have a positive role as a, maybe a spark or a mm-hmm. catalyst or a shift or something, or in general, are emotions a negative thing? I think one point that I think is so important, well, there's, there's many points, but in terms of this, what, a first point that I think is really important is, you know, we often kind of think about certain emotions as being either good or bad, you know. So so we might think of being anxious or, or concerned about something as, as inherently bad uh, and something that we want to avoid and something actually we, by avoiding, we try to suppress. And, you know, if, if somebody asked me a question about this when I was a kid while, watching sport, what I would observe with athletes, I would have thought, oh gosh, they must be suppressing their anxiety, the, their nerves, their worries. They, they have to just just push them down. Um, but but actually, it's it's much more sophisticated than that. And what athletes are doing is isn't really about um, suppression. Um, so I think a first point that's really good to know here is is that. Um, Emotions are not really good or bad. Every emotion has a purpose and, and emotions have, have a function, if you like. Um, and even some that we think of as maybe bad. So if we take the example I mentioned, you know, um, anxiety or, or it's near neighbor concern, which is a healthier form. Um, being concerned about something. So if an athlete, for example, is concerned before a race or, or if, if somebody's concerned before a presentation or an interview or whatever, that can be a useful thing, you know, that can, that can signal certain information to us about, you know, am I prepared for this situation? Have I, have I done the things I need to do in this situation to, to, to be the best, to perform the best that I can? So that feeling of concern or that feeling of anxiety can actually be an important cue, an important driver. Uh, and if we listen to it and if we tune into it and if we use that as a source of information, then actually what it's telling us is, you know, maybe I need to do a little bit more preparation here. I'm not quite ready for or certain situations that might happen in, in a race or in a presentation or an exam or whatever it might be. And so, so you know, this actually sometimes can tie quite neatly back to the, the if-then plan, you know, uh, that we spoke about previously. Um, anger is another one, and we, we, we spoke, speak a little bit about this too, that Again, we often think about anger as being bad, but but actually anger can be expressed the right way, not suppressed, um, can actually be very, very healthy and very, very useful. Um, so, you know, when we talk about things like assertiveness, that, that's a healthier form of uh, anger and expressed in the right way can can help us to deal with situations in our life too. So so that's probably a first point that... that um, a lot of these emotions that, that we speak about are not necessarily good or bad. Uh, they can be pleasant or unpleasant, uh, but in the right context and expressed the right way, they, they can also be very helpful as well. Um, so, so, so that's the first thing. Um, in terms of suppression, um, there's actually a really neat study, you know, that that, that we we sort of speak a little bit about, uh, and I hope it's okay. If you've read the book, Brad, so I hope it's okay to talk about this. Oh, absolutely, this on, absolutely, because folks, they're they're going to need to pull this thing up. <laughs> this is this has got all the stuff we're talking about and even more. Yeah, so so this was a really interesting um, study that looked at the impact of emotion suppression on uh, sporting performance. Um, and the emotion that the, the researchers tried to dig up in this study was disgust. Um, so what they do, what they did was they had participants uh, do a series of 10K cycling time trials, um, and they asked them to do each one as quickly as possible. 
Um, the first one was just a baseline. So, so basically, you know, no special uh, uh, conditions or anything like that. It was just get on the bike, cycle as, as far as you can uh, or as fast as you can for a 10K. Well, the second and third, what they did was they showed the participants a video before the second and third time trials. And this was a, a video which was designed to elicit disgust. Um, so what they had was somebody um, throw up in the video uh, and then eat uh, eat it back down again, which, I mean, I haven't seen this video, but it, it sounds absolutely oh. horrendous. Now, you've you've expressed your, your feelings right there. Yeah. And in, in, in one condition, participants were allowed to express how they felt in whatever way they wanted. But in the other condition, they had to suppress that emotion mm. so they couldn't, you know, uh, make any verbalizations. They couldn't even express it you know in terms of their body language or facial expression or anything like that they, they just had to suppress it right down and what they found was that the suppression trial was performed by 2.3 percent slower uh, than the non-suppression trial uh, which is about 25 seconds for, for these participants and what that shows just even just a very simple emotions suppression task like that uh, can impact sporting performance um and, and the reason they suggested it is because when we try to suppress our emotions, use the kind of the term earlier, it takes a lot of fuel. It takes a lot of mental fuel to, to suppress those. It takes a lot of self-control or willpower. And that can hurt our performance. Self-control and willpower are limited resources. And just like suppressing an emotion takes uh, self-control, so too does performing a 10K as fast as you can. You've, you've got a control urges to stop or to quit. Um, and so when you deplete that resource by suppressing an, suppressing an emotion, for example, it can also hurt performance mm. in, in, in other areas. So I think the key thing here is, is that learning how to express our emotions or learning how to manage our emotions in, in a healthier way is much more effective than trying to suppress them, trying to avoid them or trying to, to hide them in some way, um, which can be, I suppose, in a sporting context can be unhelpful, but actually in a, in a real life context as well. Ultimately, what tends to happen when we, we try to suppress emotions this way is that ultimately we experience them more intensely and, and in doing so, we tend to vent them more maybe aggressively or violently or, or whatever it might be. So, so expressing them or having some way of expressing them is a much healthier way of dealing with those emotions. Well, and coming back to your if then, so if I'm in whatever, let's say a triathlon and I've gone through the if then of a flat tire, then my, then my emotional response is significantly different than if I haven't. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to use this pump. And I, I'm not sure I have the right CO2 cartridge, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm, same situation, same flat tire, same race, same temperature, same everything else. One, I've gone through the if then. So I simply get off my bike, change the tire, get back on and move. There's no need for the emotion. I'm not suppressing it. It's just not a need for it. The other one, I haven't done that exercise. And now I'm all you know all up in arms and going oh my gosh what am i going to do so that exercise your first one can help your second one you're talking about absolutely because you, you've got a plan in place to to deal with that scenario and i mentioned michael phelps earlier and, and you know the great story which again you can find out a little bit on, on this and both in the book and and uh, he's spoken about it quite openly is uh so during a 200 meter butterfly final in the uh uh, I think it was 2008 Olympics, um, similar to, to that puncture tire scenario, his goggles started to leak during the race. And, and a strategy that Bob Bowman, his coach, and, and Michael Phelps himself had developed was that if, you know, if something like that, so again, if situation, an obstacle, if something like that were to happen in a race, what would they do? Um, and he had a whole load of different scenarios that could happen, his suit ripping, et cetera, et cetera. But in this particular example, his, his goggles started to leak. And I think, you know, if most of us, if our goggles started to leak and suddenly, you know, I mean, you're swimming blind, you, you don't know where the lane markers are, you don't know when you have to turn up. Uh, I thought, you know, I asked, I asked a group of athletes this recently when I was giving this example, and I sort of asked, you know, what would you do? And, and people are like, you know, this is an Olympic final, by the way. Well, I'd probably stop or I'd panic <laughs> or I'd just, you know, I'd, I'd just give up in the race or whatever it was. But but his then, his his solution, if anything happened, was to start counting his strokes. Uh, so, okay, what's he doing there? So he's staying focused. He knew it would take about 21 strokes to swim a length. Um, he, so he stayed calm, he stayed focused, he focused on the process of swimming as fast as he can. And as he swam the final length, he counted 19, 
20 and on 21 he reached out and touched the wall he won the race in a world record time um despite the fact that he couldn't see where he was going in, in that final length so so again that just shows how having a plan yeah. can really help your emotional response in that situation and, and in that context having a plan helps you focus on the things you would want to focus on to swim as as, as fast as you can or cycle as fast as you can in, in your example as well Let's jump into self-talk. Um, one of our published studies looked at self-talk in runners, and I, 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 I wasn't surprised by the results. I was surprised by the magnitude of the results. We saw far bigger impact on that than I or I think Mark or Martin did as well. Um, how does you, you, you talk about self-talk in, in your book. How does that play a role in our non-athletic lives, and what are some key tips to, to applying that to what we're doing on a daily basis? Yeah, and and by the way, I love that study that you published on on self talk with runners. It was, it was a really nice study, and one th- one thing I loved on that actually as well was um, how some runners, even though they perceive their effort to be extremely high before the intervention, w- was actually even higher afterwards. So <laughs> they had I had no I, idea. I just, yeah, yeah, they I, were like, "Oh my gosh, how did that happen?" <laughs> Um, I, I thought that was incredible, and, and it shows how just how effective and how powerful what we say to ourselves um, can be. So, so yeah. So, so when we talk about well, when we talk about self talk, really, it's that kind of inner chatter, that inner dialogue that we all have, or monologue sometimes that we all have with ourselves. And actually, when it, when it comes to sporting context, and especially you know our field in, in endurance. The evidence base for for self talk is probably one of the strongest of, of mm. all the techniques. Um, there's some really good evidence about how uh, it can help to to improve performance, to cope with you know higher perceptions of of effort that you know this task is really hard and and I want to stop right now, etc. Um, and it was really probably the last point. It was really fun for me to dig into some of the research on this outside of um, the sporting context as well. And I'll talk to one or two studies, which I absolutely adore. They're brilliant studies. But broadly, well, I guess to talk about our self-talk. So you know, sometimes our self-talk. Um, well, I guess sometimes it can be very negative and, and almost defeatist in some situations. So, so it can be very simple things that we sometimes say to ourselves, like, you know, I can't do this or I give up. And, and that's not just in sport. You know, it can be completely trying to do math or, or it can, you know, in a presentation or an interview or whatever it might be. And I guess the important thing, one of the important things to, to, to indicate there is that what we say to ourselves kind of such a powerful influence on A, how we feel. And then be how we subsequently act. Um, so, so for an endurance athlete, you know, if I'm saying to myself, "I can't do this. This is, this is too hard. I give up." Well, guess what? I'm, I'm probably going to give up, or I'm probably going to slow down. You know, much sooner than than I otherwise would. And what the research has shown is that when we say very simple things to ourselves, like, you know, "I can do this. Keep going. You you can do this." Um, that those simple statements, repeating those simple statements to ourselves, kind of such a powerful influence on our performance. And you've shown it in in your research with with 800 meter runs, um, and some of the, some other research, you know, going from um, time to exhaustion trials where where people literally go on a bike at about 80% of their max and try to maintain that for as, as long as they possibly can. There's, there's a cl- classic study from 2014, but it's 2014, but it's a classic study on, in this area already, I feel. And what they showed was that a two-week self-talk intervention with very simple statements, type statements that I just mentioned, um, improved cycling to exhaustion time by 18% um, in a wow. group in a group of athletes. Um, 80, cycling at 80% of our max, most of us, uh, unless you're an exceptional athlete like like you, Brad, most of us, like me, would maintain about 10 minutes probably at an intensity like that. It's, it's exceptionally difficult. Um, but these participants who were just repeating simple self-talk statements they'd learned, like, I can do this, keep going, push through this, lasted 18% longer, which, wow. which is incredible. It's no, absolutely it it's huge. Um, so it shows how, how powerful it can be. And, and there's some re- recent studies actually which, which have built on this. And, and there was a study by some of the same researchers recently, and I love this one. Um, wh- what they did was kind of similar statements. So it was like, you know, I can do this, um, I can push through this. But they had participants do cycling time trials, either s- speaking to themselves in the first person. So again, I can do this, I can push through this. Or in the third person, so yes. you can do this, you can push through this. Um, and what they found was actually the participants in the third person condition uh, perform faster. 
yes. than they did in the first person, even though they found the statements equally motivating uh, in the second, in the uh, in both the uh, conditions. Right. Yeah. Uh, and what they suggested was uh, when we speak to ourselves in the, in the second person, sorry, in the third person, like you can do this, mm-hmm. or I might say to myself, come on, Noel, you know, you can do you this. this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, what we do is, is we create this, this self-distancing effect, this psychological sense of distance between ourselves and what we're experiencing. Um, so we almost might speak to ourselves like an encouraging friend would do or, or a coach might do or a, a supportive work colleague might do. And this psychological distance, and, and the opposite is a self-immersed perspective, which is the I, 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 I'm in this world of pain right now doing this task and it's really challenging and I'm not sure I can do this. So, so what was fun to, for me was to actually dig into some of the research on this outside of, of the sporting context. And, and what they found is actually some of the effects are, are just the same. That when people speak to themselves and create in, in the third person and create, create this self-distance perspective, that pressurized situations seem less anxiety provoking, um, performance ob, uh, rated objectively. So this might be the performance of somebody giving a presentation, for example. They're rated as more coherent, more fluent by somebody when they're speaking to themselves in the third person rather than in the, the first person condition. And the one I absolutely love, an example from one of these studies that I absolutely love, Brad, was um, an account of um, somebody who's going on their first date and they were really anxious <laughs> about their first date and they give an account of the, the narrative um, and it was things like oh you can do this you can do this why, why why did I say that come on man pull it together get through this you know and, and so it was this again it showed how when we speak to ourselves in the first person that's oh, why did I say that that can be really anxiety provoking but when we take a step back that self-distancing you know you can do this you 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 can get it back together whatever it might be can be really helpful um so 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 those are some areas from self-talk that I love and and the real fun that I think was really finding out how that can help in everyday life as well I've been practicing my my third person self-talk a lot since this really <laughs> research I love it. So, well, two things came to mind. One, I was trying to learn to tie a bow tie a couple of years ago and um, I could not get it. And I'm just like, you're an idiot. You can never, you, you, your eye hand coordination just, and then I'm like, dude, you've got four college degrees. I, th- I think you can learn to tie a bow tie. And the very next time I got it, it was just that like recentering and not just flying off the handle and me, oh, you're such an idiot, whatever. But putting in perspective. And that, that begs my other question. I wonder, does self listening precede self talk? Is it that recognition of, well, that's, you're not making sense, Brad, of course you can learn to tie a bow tie. Let, take a step back. Have you seen anything like that about the self listen? I know I don't remember seeing any reference to self listening, but would self listening naturally need to precede self talk? I think that, that's an absolutely great point. Um, I think it's what's important, I think, in, in terms of a first step is becoming aware of our self-talk and in, in any self-talk intervention. That's really the first thing. And, and the way we might do that is, you know, really as simple as sometimes keeping a diary. Um, what do I say to myself in certain certain situations? And then the next part is, how does that make me feel? So if if I'm in a, a performance context, be it sport or or in another area of life, you know, what what story do I tell myself? What what do I tell myself in that situation? And if my if the statements I notice are things like, you know, I suck at this, I'm, I'm terrible, I can't do this. Right. And then becoming more aware of actually how that makes me feel. I think the key point in this is, uh, and this is coming from kind of a cognitive behavioral perspective, is that often we think that it's a situation that makes us feel a certain way. So um, I'm terrible at exams. I, I, I hate whatever it might be. I always perform poorly in whatever the context is. But when we become aware of our thoughts and what we say to ourselves, the realization there very often is that it's not the situation that makes me feel this way. It's what I say to myself that makes me feel this way. And that's yeah. where I think the listening comes in. The the awareness uh, kind of comes in. And once we develop that awareness, then it becomes, you know, we, we become less focused on the situation, like avoiding a presentation or whatever it might be, and more about the story, the things we say to ourselves in that situation. 
and, and, and I guess the last bit then is kind of changing our self-talk so that we're using statements that are more encouraging, more supportive, maybe even sometimes more self-calming in that situation to help us manage our emotional response. And, and, and self-listening is, is, is a great term to use because that's where we develop the awareness, I think, for, for a strategy then like a self-talk intervention to become more beneficial and more helpful. So let's jump into this idea of momentum. Chapter eight, I, I think that might, from my perspective, might be your most important chapter in the whole book. Um, we all tend to be pretty good about getting started. You mentioned New Year's resolutions. Hey, I'm going to do this. Here we go. Let's do this thing. But staying the course, that can often be a different story. What are some of the keys to the maintaining momentum that might help our listeners as they're doing this? Um. So, so thank you for for what you said about that chapter. This is, um, I, I think you're right. I think it's one that's really important because, you know, when we were writing this book, um, there was a whole different draft of some of these chapters that are still sitting on my computer. They, they never made the light of day, and mm. one of them was about setting goals. And after writing this chapter, we kind of sat back and we kind of thought, and the realization was, hang on, you know, people know how to set goals. You know, every, every, but we all have goals in, in, in our life. The real problems, the real issues that we face are, are following through on those goals. And even getting started, you know, we, we're pretty good at that. But you're right, it's maintaining momentum and seeing it through to completion. That's that's the little bit. So, so you know, if anybody wants the bonus chapter that's still sitting on my computer, it's, <laughs> it's, it's there. But, 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 but actually, I think the key bit, you're right, is, is, is keeping going. Um, one thing right from the get-go in this chapter um, that I think is worth mentioning is we speak a little bit about some of the, 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 the habits, if you like, the daily routines that some top athletes have. And, and I think if I was to say a, a point number one on these is that, you know, the very simple strategies like getting enough sleep, getting enough rest, um, eating healthily, all those kind of things, which, by the way, you know, when we look at New Year's resolutions that you mentioned there, those are top of the tree, right? Those mm -hmm. are the, the ones that everybody, most of us tend to set. Yeah. Um, starting there is a good point because, I mean, you know, we spoke about emotional regulation, and eating healthily, getting enough rest and sleep is is a number one thing, I think, to, to, to being able to regulate our emotions. Um, so how do we follow through on those things? Well, I think some of the strategies we spoke about are really helpful, um, like if then planning. So again, how do we overcome obstacles? So in terms of, of goal setting, it can be things like, you know, getting derailed, you know, other distractions getting in our way. So again, how will I deal with those other things that just happen in life that might might knock me off uh, track? procrastinating, you know, putting off getting started even again, how, how will I get started? And again, if then planning, going back to Golbitzer's work, that was the whole purpose. That was the whole point of following through in our intentions and, and getting started on our intentions um, by developing these, these if then plans. So, so that's kind of a, a big one there. One other thing, and I'll go back slightly on what I said about everybody knows how to set goals. Um, there's some fantastic research, very recent research on a type of goal called an open goal. It's, you know, we, most of us kind of have heard about these specific, these smart goals that we set a specific target. Like, again, I want to run a 5K. That's, that's a specific distance that I want to measurable, run. It's measurable. Measurable. Yep. All those things. Open goals um, is a relatively new area of research. And what an open goal suggests is that rather than setting something very specific, I might set myself um, a goal that goes something along the lines of, I'm going to get active and see how much I can do. Okay, so so it doesn't really have a, a ceiling, a specific target, if you like. It's it's get active and, and see how well I can do or see how far I can go. And and what the research has suggested in a physical activity context certainly is that setting open goals for people who are beginning a new behavior tend to when they engage in the activity they tend to feel less pressurized uh, and they also tend to fee, to find the activity more pleasant more enjoyable than when they set a specific goal and the reason for that is and this feeds into a lot of other things i believe as well like like our self belief our self efficacy is that if we set an open goal let, let's let's take um you know physical activity targets are 10,000 steps a day okay let's take that that's a specific measurable goal 10,000 steps well if I get active and I'm just beginning on my, my journey to get more physically active and let's say on day 
you know, the end of week one, I've averaged about 6,000 steps per day. Well, if I have that specific goal that I'm trying to reach, I might look at that 6,000 steps and say, gosh, I'm, I failed. That was dreadful. I, I only got to 6,000 steps. My goal was 10. It, I, I'll never get there. I'll never do this because I tried really hard. Whereas if I set an open goal and I suggest to myself, okay, I'm just going to get more active. I'm going to go walking every day and see how well I can do. I can look at those same 6,000 steps and think, wow, I went from zero to 6,000 this week. That's outstanding actually that's pretty incredible and I, I i quite enjoyed it let's keep this going let's let's develop on that momentum so so that's kind of one thing in terms of goal setting research that i think is fascinating how we can use different types of goals non-specific goals like open goals to give us a very different perspective on, on what we're doing and and you know the the activity in that case that that we're doing um Wait, let me jump in on that one because you sure, yeah, really yeah. got me thinking. I know the folks listening are going, wait, now what? What is he talking? Who are there a couple of researchers top of head that top of mind that you could throw out to us that have gotten into some of this open goal stuff? Absolutely. So so probably the main guy who's leading this this area of research is Christian Swan. He's um oh, yeah. he's actually a, an Irish researcher, but yeah, he's based in a university in Australia. Um and for about the past four years, he he's been one of the main guys who's been okay. uh, developing the research in, in this area. Um another group of researchers based in the University of Lincoln in in England are uh, Patricia Jackman. Um, and Rebecca Hawkins, and they've done some nice research recently as well on uh, physical activity. Okay. Uh, and again, differences for beginners between open goals and specific goals. And, and the broad finding is, is really what I've sort of mentioned there, that for beginners, which again, if we're setting a goal and if we're trying to do, again, anything, be it physical activity, go through those top five you know, New Year's resolutions, get more sleep, yeah. eat healthily, all those kind of things. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm probably expanding beyond where the research is currently at by suggesting that open goals can be effective in other areas, but certainly it seems very promising that open goals can be effective to change our perceptions of our achievements and, and, and actually the, the tasks that we're trying to, uh, trying to, to uh, begin, I guess, or, or the goal that we're trying to achieve. So the skeptic in me, or maybe some, I'm speaking for some folks listening, are saying, does that just let you off the hook? Is the idea better than yesterday? We use that phrase a lot, this idea of better than yesterday. Is the idea of that goal not, well, I can just do whatever I feel like. Is it, I, I'm going to improve? I may not walk 10,000, but I'm going to increase from my 1,500. Or is it just, I'm just going to kind of see what happens? And like, is there any, because better than yesterday still, or or improvement still has some, some sort of feedback loop, hmm. whereas, yeah. I, I don't know. So is there feedback loop still, does it still exist or do we take that completely off the table with this strategy? No, absolutely not. And, and a slight subtlety in terms of the finding this, and, and I think what you say is absolutely right, especially, you know, for somebody who's, who's really physically active, what they found in one of their studies was that for people who are regularly active, um, so you might say experienced in, in terms of physical activity, those people preferred the specific goal. Those people oh. preferred the measurable. Okay. So so again, if if we kind of maybe sort of put it this way, if somebody's really physically active, um, if we're just using physical activity as the context, so I've got the tools, I've got the skills, I know what to do. <laughs> The, the suggestion is those people like the targets. They like Got the specific it. targets. It's okay. like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm going to test myself and see if I can get to that, you know, 20 minute 5K or, or right. whatever it might be. For somebody who's beginning the behavior, who doesn't necessarily have the tools, you know, physical activity is a very complex behavior. It involves a lot of things. It's, you know, it's knowing what to do. It's reorganizing our lives sometimes to, to fit in physical activity. There's a lot of learning there. Right. And so to facilitate that learning, the open goal can sometimes feel a little bit less pressured and actually the activity more enjoyable. And to kind of close a bit of a loop there, um, one of the key things, and this is coming out from work predominantly led by a researcher called um, Patty Ekakakis, um, who's in um, Iowa State University. In terms of physical activity, he suggests that the most important thing for long-term adherence and maintenance of physical activity is that it's enjoyable during, that, that it, it leads yeah. to positive effect, um, uh, as he describes it during. And so any strategy that can help make the activity feel more pleasant, in this case, like an open goal, can uh, help to, to increase long-term adherence. And for somebody beginning and trying to maintain that momentum, 
that that can be really important. That makes sense. All right, now let's run down a little bit of a rabbit trail here. It, it seems it's, like those, I don't know, we just look around and maybe it's just because it's in the press and we're inundated with so much in terms of headlines, but it seems like so many people that are incredibly successful on the playing field are leading disastrous lives off the playing field. Well, what's going on with that? It seems like, as you've said in your book, the concepts that help in setting A apply to setting B, and yet we're not necessarily seeing that at the top levels of athletic performance. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, I think that's, that's a really, I mean, there's so many, so many ways we, we can go with this question. I think it's a really, really good question. Um, if I was to think about that from a number of different perspectives, um, I think, I suppose something that comes to mind recently, um, or, or something that comes to mind with recent examples are, um, you know, sort of mental health, for example, w- with athletes. And there's a lot of great conversations from athletes mm-hmm. um, about, you know, mental health struggles and things like that. Um, and I guess one thing that I would suggest in, in answer to that, so, so what the research would suggest is that the incidence of mental health uh, issues amongst athletes are pretty similar actually to the general population. Um, there's a whole, whole lot of nuances, nuances in that, but, but generally it's pretty similar to, to the uh, general population. But for athletes, I guess there's so many other pre- uh, pressures. I mean, for, for most of us, you know, going out, getting exercise, being physically active is, is a hobby and actually a more, an emotion regulation strategy that can be really helpful for our mental health. But for athletes, you know, things like injury, not performing as well as they might do, being deselected, and even actually the environment sometimes that athletes are operating in, I mean, it can be pretty relentless um, and, and unrelenting sometimes. And, and that can be really damaging and, and really um, leads to a lot of poor mental health outcomes and, and lower well-being amongst athletes. So, so I guess, you know, some of the reasons there are very specific to, to a sporting environment. Um, and so, you know, when we do talk a little bit about some things and especially some, some really, I think, really important, really interesting research from uh, Mustafa Sarkar, David Fletcher on sporting environments um, and how they can impact on outcomes like burnout, low mental health, et cetera. Um, and broadly how resilience is, is important and, and the sporting environment is, and it's important for that. So so that's kind of one thing I think and that's I'm I understand I'm going down a little bit of a rabbit hole there, but I think that's one thing that's quite we love important. rabbit trails here. Like, Keep going. Yeah, no, it's really <laughs> important. The other one that comes to mind when when I speak about that, and this this is very much relevant to to um, a story that we tell about um, a former US uh, miler Steve Holman um, in the book. I guess one other real challenge area for, for athletes is um, transition out of sport. Uh, and that can happen for a lot of different reasons. Um, I mean, it can happen suddenly in, term, you know, in terms of injury, the deselection, uh, or just the natural end of a career. And, and, you know, this idea of, well, you know, I've been an athlete all my life. Huge part of my whole identity as a person is, is as an athlete. What do I do now? Yeah. What do I do next? Where do I right. go next? Um, and the story that we tell a little bit is is that of Steve Holman, and and he speaks about what he described as his wilderness years um, post his athletic career, where for many years after his retirement in the early two thousands, you know, what what do I do now? You, you know, I've been an athlete all my life, and and he speaks about going for some job interviews that that he didn't get. And it's like, wow, you know, I was this, I was an Olympic athlete, and, and now I can't get you know some of the jobs that he was going for. And it took a little while, but what he realized, and, and the sort of you know, we spoke earlier about awareness of our self talk, but this is awareness in a different context of awareness of what was he good at as an athlete, and and this is maybe you know, kind of a, a truer answer to, to, to the question that you asked, you know, that we sometimes see, okay, we're suggesting here that a lot of these strategies are helpful in a, in a sporting context for athletes. And where do they apply in, in everyday life? And part of the awareness there for an athlete can be, okay, well, actually, what, what did I learn through sport? What, what was I good at in sport that I can apply to other situations in my life? And, and for athletes, these can be things like, well, you know, I was a pretty good leader. I've, I've got leadership skills. Um, I was pretty organized in my life. You know, are, are there areas of work where I can, where, where those skills, you know, I'm, I'm self-motivated, I'm really driven, I can handle pressurized situations, all these, these sort of skills. The reflection there can be, 
Yeah. Well, okay. How do they apply to, to everyday life? And Steve Holman talks a little bit about that learning process of, you know, what was I good at as an athlete? And one thing he realized was actually, you know, I, I really love to learn new things. And, and he decided to go back to college and study business. Um, and he's now senior executive at, at a, a financial services firm. Yeah. So, so he kind of, and he, he kind of worked his way through, I guess, the, 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 um, Climbed his way up the ladder in, in terms of his business um, career post sport, so so I think that's one really important um, reflection is is what am I good at as an athlete and how can that apply to other areas of life uh, for for that one scenario in terms of transitioning out of sport. And I'm not going to get into the strengths profile that you talk about in your appendix, but for folks that are facing that, like that example, that would be a great tool to go back to. Or if you have a client, I, I think you may want to pull that up because that's a way to kind of pull together some of the things in terms of what strengths do you bring to the to the table. All right. Last one, my friend, of all the keys you cover in the book and in your research, you don't have to stay to the book here. What's the greatest opportunity that most of us are missing out on right now that you want to leave us with as we kind of close the window on this thing? Well, thank you for the opportunity to to talk about my research as well. Um, I'll, I'll keep it short because that could go on a while. Um, <laughs> if, if, if I could summar, summarize it in one statement, in one one phrase even that I've learned from the athletes I've interviewed and also that I've learned through writing this book, the, the phrase that I would use is psychological flexibility or mental mm. flexibility. And, and what I've learned from... Um, researching athletes from from researching this book, from writing about the, the the examples that we have in there, is that you know very often we're we sometimes think we've only got one tool in a certain situation, we've only one way of dealing with a certain situation that may not always be helpful. I recently read an example where, um, and the example they gave to to kind of illustrate this idea of flexibility is is uh, imagine you're trying to get a drink out of a out of a vending machine, and, and it, you know you you put in your money, you press the button, and it doesn't work. And you know what do we do? We keep pressing the button, we keep pressing the button. We just we just think we got this one tool that we can use. To move away from that analogy, the idea of flexibility is that there's lots of different tools that we can use in in, in the same situation. Uh, and that might be different tools that we can use to manage our emotions, the different things that we can say to ourselves that we spoke about. And again, going right back to that if-then planning, planning different ways that we can respond to challenges, to, to obstacles that we might experience. So to summarize it, I think that idea of psychological flexibility, and we try to write this book in this way, that there's all these different tools you mentioned the strengths profiling uh, tool there as well. And, you know, part of that process is becoming aware of the situations that we might find challenging and then using the menu of tools to find out, okay, what would suit me in this situation? What can I use in this situation that might help me, you know, manage my emotions in that situation or deal with that situation in a different way that to a way that may not have been working previously. So psychological flexibility, that's, that's the thought I'd like to leave that we've different tools uh, and learning how to use those different tools in a situation can be something really useful to do. I love it. My friend, this was so good. I, I really appreciate it. I've got, you can see I've got scribbles all over my notes. I've already read your book. I mean, we, there's a lot in here. So thanks for taking the time. We really, really appreciate it. What's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Uh, and thank you for for having me on, Brad. I really appreciate it. Um, probably the best way to 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 keep in touch is on Twitter. Um, so it's at Noel Bricky, uh, N O E L B R I C K I E. Um, and you'll also find on, on Twitter if for anyone who's on Twitter um, a link to my website on there as well, which is noelbrick.com. So so those are probably the easiest ways to to keep up. Perfect. We'll keep up the great work. This is great stuff. And like I said, we, Alex Hutchinson is one of my favorite guests we've ever had. And when he wrote the top of your book here, I was like, okay, we got to talk to Dr. Brick because he's got something going on right here. <laughs>